presentation of Vote 08 on WPSU is made possible in part by a grant from Caparilla Furniture, serving central Pennsylvania for over 50 years with showrooms in Belfont, Altoona, and Lewistown. Featuring Thomasville Furniture. Information at caparillafurniture.com. Additional support comes from the members of WPSU. With the retirement of Representative John Peterson, the race for the 5th Congressional District is wide open for the first time in a decade. The candidates have been on the campaign trail for months, and tonight they face off in the last televised debate before the November 4th election. Live from WPSU on the Penn State University Park campus, we bring you Race for the 5th, Vote 08. And here's your host and moderator for the evening, Patty Satalia. Good evening and thanks for joining us. In just 12 days, you'll head to the polls to choose the candidate you think will best represent the citizens of Pennsylvania's 5th Congressional District. Over the next hour, you'll hear from the candidates about where they stand on the issues. Throughout tonight's debate, you can participate in a live chat with other listeners at WPSU.org slash vote 08. We'd also like to note that tonight's debate is being simulcast in high definition on WPSU HD. Now let's meet the candidates. Jim Fryman from Victory Township, Venango County, is the Libertarian candidate. He is a retired real estate negotiator with PennDOT. Glenn Thompson is a Republican from Howard Township, Center County. He's a health care administrator and a former county Republican chairman. Mark McCracken is a Democrat. He currently serves as a Clearfield County Commissioner. Thank you all for joining us. WPSU's political team wrote most of the questions for tonight's debate. We also solicited questions from newspapers within the 5th District, and we'll take one question from our live chat. In addition, candidates were asked to submit a question of their own to pose to their opponents. And in the interest of fairness, each candidate will be required to answer his own question. Our first question tonight was submitted by the Ridgeway Record. Uh, what is the most pressing issue uh, facing Pennsylvania? And that first question goes to Glenn Thompson. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for putting this forum on. The, certainly the most pressing issue facing Pennsylvania today is our, our energy crisis. And it's a, it's a problem that intertwines, it, it impacts our local and our national economy, and frankly, it impacts our national security. Uh, you know, we are dependent on foreign countries for 70% of our, our resources. Uh, you know, there's a, um, uh, a woman in my hometown that uh, in her 80s, her home heating bill just tripled and the cap came off. Uh, she's going to be paying over $600 a month. You multiply that times 10,000. That's the impact that we have just in the 5th Congressional District. So we, we need a comprehensive energy plan. Uh, we have not had leadership on that from Congress or any number of the past administrations, and, and we need it today. We can do that by utilizing our, our abundant natural resources that we have, and that includes all of our oil, our gas, uh, our coal, uh, and using the clean technology that we have today, building nuclear power plants, doing the research and development, and, and building the alternative fuels that, that will be out there for us in the future to be able to fill the void, but today really doesn't do that. Mark McCracken? Well, you know, I believe that the, uh, in a broader sense, it's, it's overall it's the economy that, that is the problem and the concern of people, uh, not only here in the 5th Congressional District, but across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and across the nation. Um, especially here in the 5th Congressional District, uh, you know, we, we have a, uh, a very large problem with the unemployment rates here uh, in, the, in the 17 counties. Uh, 16 of the 17 counties in the 5th District are over 5% unemployment. Uh, and, and additionally, wages here are much lower than what they are across the uh, rest of the United United States. Uh, U.S. Census Bureau figures tell us that uh, you know, we're on average $12,000 less per year um, th than what the rest of the nation is. So what, what we need to be working on is, uh, you know, is uh, spurring our economy, stimulating our economy here in the 5th uh, District. And I think what we can do is, uh, you know, it dovetails into a little bit of what Mr. Thompson is saying, it is energy. And I think uh, you know, we're, we're um, setting right on the cusp of uh, having a big energy boom right here in the 5th Congressional District uh, with the ethanol plant that's coming to Clearfield County, a $279 million project that's going to uh, bring over 100 jobs and many spin-off uh, jobs to the area, and also the Marcellus Shale. I mean, we're setting here right now, and uh, we can spur our economy, grow it, and, and these will be good 
paying jobs that will lower unemployment and uh, give us better wages. Some agreement between our main party candidates. Uh, we go to our libertarian Jim Fryman. Do you see things a little bit differently in terms of the most pressing problems facing Pennsylvania? Well, quite a few of them are interrelated. Uh, I think the economy is the biggest problem. Energy is a part of that. As far as energy goes, I think uh, we should let the market allocate reset uh, sources most efficiently. Um, we have, a, uh, with one exception, I believe we should retain the gasoline tax. It's a fair use tax because uh, if you have a heavier load, you do more damage to the roads and you pay more in tax. If you travel more miles, you do more damage to the roads, you should pay more in tax. And the gasoline tax helps uh, allocate more resources instead of giving government grants to people that jump through the right hoops to uh, develop alternative forms of uh, energy. The uh, gasoline tax helps make alternative forms of energy more uh, competitive and adds to the coffers too. I think it's a fair tax. Also, we have to cut a lot of things with government to uh, balance the budget. We have to eliminate most of our foreign aid. Uh, we have to do away with the Department of Education. It's a relatively recent development under President Carter. And uh, it, should, it would be better handled by local uh, school districts and uh, parents. We need diversity of educational methods in each school district so we can see what works and what doesn't, not the federal government in their infinite wisdom dictating that kids be educated the same way in Phoenix, Arizona, or uh, State College, Pennsylvania, or Franklin, Pennsylvania, or Youngstown, Ohio. It's uh, a lot of other things we have to do as far as the economy. Most of it is by cutting spending. Okay. Speaking of spending, uh, top on the minds of voters nationwide uh, is this recent $700 billion bailout. All of you opposed uh, that which passed by Congress. Why did you oppose it, Mark McCracken, and what should the federal government do to help stabilize the U.S. economy? Well, you know, I, I think what we, uh, you know, we looked at when the bailout uh, announcement came out was the fact that the President and uh, the Treasury Secretary told us, uh, you know, what they wanted to do and why they wanted to do it. What they failed to tell the American people, though, was how they were going to pay for it. And, you know, we've already seen the impact of this bailout going on the national uh, debt. It went over $11 trillion now. Um, just in the last few weeks, it's went up $2 trillion um, you know, since the bailout uh, came about. And, uh, you know, I think what we should have, uh, should have been hearing is more specific details on you know, how much money was needed and why a specific amount of money was needed. They just seemed to have pulled that $700 billion figure out of the air, and then they made it worse uh, by adding the sweeteners to it uh, to, to convince the members of Congress, uh, the Senate uh, passed a bill, sent it back over with uh, uh, you know, a lot of more uh, pork added to it. And, you know, we're in a situation right now with the federal uh, budget where it's at a $282 uh, you know, or $482 billion deficit and the, uh, you know, the debt's just growing uncontrollably. And, uh, you know, I, I think what we need to see happen is we need to uh, step back. I think the markets will settle down after November 4th. I think the financial markets worldwide um, are waiting to see what the United States is going to decide with the, uh, who they're going to put in as their next president and uh, you know, also what the control of Congress is going to be. Um, so I think there just needs to be kind of a uh, cooling off period here and let, let, let the market settle down. He's suggesting we back off in terms of uh, the federal government's role in, in, in stabilizing the U.S. economy. What's your take, Mr. Fryman? I think actually it's a moot point now. The markets hate st instability. They hate uh, uncertainty. And this uh, bailout is uncertainty. No one knows who's going to get what and when it's going to take place. I think uh, most of the stock market drop happened after the president got on television that day and said uh, there was going to be a bailout. And everyone decided to stop buying, stop selling, just see what happens. Um, to stabilize the economy, uh, we should have just let the uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand take care of it. I think it would uh, have... A, have bounce back a lot more quickly without this bailout. The bailout's going to slow it down because there's all kind of government regulation and red tape and strings attached to everything. We have to let creative destruction take place and the economy cleanse itself and inefficiency get wiped away and uh, just remain uh, with the new efficient banks and insurance and businesses. Glenn Thompson, we can't rewind, so where do we go from here? What role should the federal government play in restoring stability to the U.S. economy? And restoring confidence to the to the to the markets, and that's the, that's the two principles that, that I use when I look at that, uh, taxpayer protection and stabilizing the markets. And, and what, what Congress did and the President signed, and, and frankly what's being, 
what is being uh, proposed in Congress today with the second economic stimulus package of $300 billion uh, does not address either of those and doesn't go far enough with those. The, the, the solutions I look for are smart government solutions, not big government solutions. And that's all we've had is big government solutions. Smart government solutions would be things like cutting the capital gains tax, eliminating tax on interest earned and dividends. What, what would that do? That would stimulate capital in the market. It would provide confidence to, for people to be able to make investments and to keep their money in investments. And that would be good. I mean, that would, uh, it would provide our business, our industries, our banks with the, uh, with the capital that they need for, for growing the economy and for making investments and for building. Uh, and we didn't see that. Uh, the, the other thing is, I, I think it would go a long ways and be a strong message if we would look at the root cause and hold the people accountable that caused this to happen. And that's going back to Freddie, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. You know, there was nothing in the bill that was passed and signed that addressed uh, that issue, that, that provided any kind of, uh, kind of uh, follow-up to the fact that we had uh, created these monopolies that now have full government backing and, and that acted in an irresponsible manner. Uh, even the people on Wall Street, the executives and the, and the folks at Freddie, uh, the, uh, the people running Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, they were allowed to keep their uh, golden parachutes. Now, the, the, the law that was passed said they couldn't have any new severance packages, did nothing about the millions and millions of dollars. And that's a shame that the only people that are going to benefit financially from that, from this whole terrible situation, are the ones that helped cause it. You said government should respond in, in a smart way. Can you be more concrete about what that might be? Are we talking about funding projects that might stimulate the economy? Well, let me, let me repeat what I just said. <laughs> Cutting the capital gains tax and eliminating tax on interest and eliminating tax on dividends. Uh, the Heritage Foundation just, re uh, just issued uh, some thoughts that they had on uh, proper ways, what I would consider smart government ways. Uh, I've been talking about those solutions since day one. Uh, um, actually, I've been talking about those solutions since before the, the, the second bill was, uh, was actually uh, passed by the House and Senate and signed by the President. The Heritage Foundation just came out today, and they embraced in, uh, those uh, positions that, that I've been talking about for some time. Mark McCracken, uh, cutting the capital gains tax, he says will stimulate growth and investment. What's your take on that? Well, I, I think the thing is, though, we are at uh, such, a, such a crisis point with our federal government right now with how deep they are in debt. Um, we have to face reality. The government needs enough revenue uh, to cover all of its costs. And, and at times when we've had difficult times in the past, um, in the Depression, other times to stimulate the uh, nation, the government has jumped in and, and, and did infrastructure projects uh, you know, to get things moving along. So um, you know, I, I think it's irresponsible at this point in time that we be talking about any other tax cuts until we get the federal government's fiscal crisis back in order. I keep saying that we need to have our federal government properly funded and leading by example, uh, you know, rather than, uh, uh, you know, we, we should be setting the example for our uh, industries and businesses rather than operating with such a big debt load. Speaking of taxes, our, our first question that will be posed by a candidate uh, is, uh, will be posed by Glenn Thompson, which is related uh, to what we've been talking about here. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Uh, here's my question. The, uh, the, the Economic Growth and Tax Relief Reconciliation Act, uh, which were the tax cuts of 2001, uh, which includes the elimination of the death tax and marriage penalty, is set to expire in 2010 under a sunset provision. Upon its expiration, Americans will see the largest tax increase in history. Do you support making this act permanent? That question will go first to Jim Fryman. We're talking basically about the Bush tax cuts. Well, the so-called Bush tax cuts, or as Mr. Thompson says, our tax cuts, I think should be made permanent, but I'd go further than that. I'm in favor of doing away with the corporate income tax. The corporate income tax, uh, corporations can only spend that money on uh, dividends, wages, and salaries, which are already taxed to the recipients, or it can uh, spend it on capital improvement, which creates more jobs and makes more people paying taxes. And I think uh, it would put us on an even footing in the global economy with uh, other countries if we did away with the corporate income tax. Uh, we have the second highest corporate income tax from what I'm told, and uh, it's a hindrance to our economy. Not only we, could we export more, it would eliminate the uh, benefit of companies sending jobs overseas. Now when they bring money back that they've earned, multinational com companies bring money back they earned overseas, it uh, is taxed. If with no corporate income tax, it would make it a moot point. 
and they could put that money back into the United States where we have a, a highly productive labor force that should be utilized. Mark McCracken, do you believe that the uh, act should become permanent? No, I don't believe it should become permanent because if you look back at the facts, um, uh, you know, throughout the 90s, we had the longest period of expansion. The, we had a uh, balanced budget, we had a surplus growing, and we were paying down the debt. Um, when, uh, when George Bush ran in 2000, this was one of his uh, platforms that he ran on it, he was going to go in and uh, uh, reinstitute the trickle-down theory, which had been proved in the past that it really didn't work, and, uh, and, and what happened? Uh, the, the tax cuts were put in place, and then, of course, you know, we had the tragedy of 9-11. Uh, we had to go to war, uh, both in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, the thing is, good fiscal responsible, responsible policy would have been to pay for the war. The American people knew were, were ready, uh, you know, were ready to uh, pay the cost to uh, uh, to you know, get a resolution after the 9-11 uh, attacks. And you, you, you couldn't go into that big of a military operation and not properly fund it. And, uh, and like I said, I just keep looking back at where we were in 2000. We finally had good fiscal policy in place that had balanced the budget, was building a surplus and paying down the debt. And for the, uh, uh, you know, for the uh, you know, uh, quick, uh, you know, quick fix of a uh, tax cut, um, they, they, they did that in 2000 and more in 2003. When we were in the middle of a war, that was not responsible. Glenn Thompson, it's your question. Should the Bush tax cuts be permanent? Well, I do prefer to call them our tax cuts. We benefit from them. Seventy percent of our jobs in the 5th Congressional District come from small business businesses. Many of those pay those taxes. Uh, if those tax cuts are not made permanent, we're going to lose a lot of small business jobs throughout this district. That's irresponsible. We, uh, if you want to repress something, tax it. And, and here's the fact about tax policy. Uh, we, you do repress things by taxing it. The 2003 tax cuts have doubled the economy since then. Now, we are in a bad situation financially, and that is because this government has not lived within its means. It has overspent. And some of those reasons are related to the wars, and there's no doubt about that. And any time we've gone to war, there's, it's expensive in, in more ways than one. And we... Uh, but that being said, uh, we need to make these tax cuts permanent. It helps to grow. It stimulates economic growth. It helps our economy grow. It's good for our citizens, especially at a time when they're facing record energy costs. You know, there are uh, uh, many, many taxpayers. Uh, the, uh, the, the numbers I looked at, if these tax cuts are let to expire, uh, it's going to cost the average taxpayer $1,800 per household. In the 5th Congressional District, there's a lot of people that are living paycheck to paycheck. I don't know how they're going to handle that, let alone we, we need to continue our, our economic growth that we have. It's, uh, it's, and I, so I support making the tax cuts permanent. Okay, our next uh, candidate question comes from Mark McCracken, and it too is uh, related to the economy. Well, I, I think this is a perfect uh, follow-up. Uh, as a member of Congress, uh, uh, you know, we have to deal with this $10 trillion debt before we pass it on to our children and grandchildren. What specific steps would you propose to pay down the $10 trillion debt? And we'll begin with Glenn Thompson. Uh, Mark, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> my, uh, I have, uh, my proposal is not typical. You know, usually we get into these partisan debates. I'm going to cut out that department. I'm going to cut out that, this department. And because of partisanism, that, those kinds of arguments are going to go nowhere in reality. Uh, my proposal is a right size our government, our federal government. And we have, a, we have an incredible opportunity to do that based on the demographics of our country today. The single largest employer in the United States is, unfortunately, the federal government. And I've looked at workforce issues related as a part of my health care career uh, during the past five, seven years, knowing that we are experiencing and will be experiencing significant retirements within the baby boomer generation, which is the generation that makes up most of those positions within the federal government across all agencies and all aspects of the federal government. We need, what we need to do is to take that opportunity fairly painless. You don't have to lay anybody off. There's, what happens is when people are retired, you look at each specific position and you look and is there a smarter, is there a more efficient, is there a better way to do business? And, and here's a novel idea where we can take some uh, lessons from and that's our manufacturing industry right here in America, right here in the 5th District. Today our manufacturing industry is more productive dollar-wise and volume-wise than ever in the history of this country. Now, there are a lot fewer people working manufacturing than, than, than used to, however. And the reason, the difference is the application of technology. 
Let's learn from manufacturing. Let's take technology. Let's see how we can apply technology to do things that are more efficient, say, uh, smarter, uh, and smaller, and be more productive uh, for our federal government. I think that's a great approach that people aren't talking about, but one I'm looking forward to taking to Washington on behalf of the people of the 5th District. Jim Fryman, how to pay down the $10 trillion national debt? Well, in addition to uh, right-sizing the government, we have to uh, end the war on drugs, which has been costly for 40 years. And uh, my dad used to play guitar in a band in speakeasies in Pittsburgh <laughs> during the Prohibition. And it just seems like so many parallels. And I used to say to him, well, why did everyone drink back then? He says, because you weren't allowed to. And uh, I think a lot of it's the same thing with kids nowadays. It's such a hot button issue. They do it to rebel. They try drugs. And like Milton Friedman said, if we legalize drugs, it would reduce the price so low it would put 90% of drug dealers out of business. They'd have to move in with their mother. And uh, we have to eliminate the war on drugs, and we have to uh, get us out of Iraq as safely and quickly as possible, and uh, right-sized government, like Mr. Uh, uh, Thompson says. And then we can start from there to have surpluses again, hopefully. Uh, we do have to keep a lot of programs. We have to keep Social Security maybe for a few years, do away with the COLA, the cost of living allowance. Mark McCracken, your question, answer to your own question, if you would, please. Well, you know, I think the first thing that we need to do in Congress is, is put an end to this uh, eight-year-long borrow-and-spend mentality that's been going on that's, that's, that's driven this debt up. Um, you know, I believe we should institute a strict pay-as-you-go policy, and I mean really adhere to it, because uh, you know, they've talked about pay-as-you-go, that no new uh, programs, um, unless there is funding provided, because they, they've been cowards down in Washington. They, they've put new programs in, and they've charged it up on the credit card. Um, you know, again, with, with the last question, I think that we need to go ahead and let the Bush tax cuts expire. But on the back end of that, we need to look at uh, proposing a new round of uh, you know, tax cuts uh, targeted towards the middle class where it's really needed, so it can help, uh, uh, you know, help our middle class and working people so they can afford the... Uh, the, the higher costs of, our, of, of energy and goods. Um, you know, I'd also support, uh, um, you know, put, putting in uh, programs that would, would uh, spur uh, uh, saving for uh, co colleges, for, uh, for children's college funds, and to pay for health care costs. I think on the military side, we need to look at right-sizing the military budget and uh, also looking at the military uh, contractors that we have out there and finally put an end to uh, these outrageous costs that are getting, uh, getting charged uh, there. And then finally, we can save 10 to $12 billion a month uh, by bringing our troops home from Iraq. Let the, let the Iraqi people rebuild their own country. I'd like you to respond, Glenn Thompson. Uh, Mark McCracken said that the Bush tax cuts should expire. Um, but according to Dr. Peter Urzog of the Congressional Budget Office, if we could recoup the revenue lost by the tax cuts, which you support, it would roughly eliminate the deficit. I'm wondering how you'd respond to that. Well, the, the numbers I've looked at and, and look over history in terms of tax cuts, developing, improving and increasing economic growth. And, uh, and and when when, you, when we do that, the government gets more resources in. Uh, so uh, tax policy is is complicated. No, you know, make no doubt about that. But the bottom line is, you want to repress something, we tax it. We want to repress our economy, let's tax our citizens. You know, uh, you know, the solution I heard Mark talk about is, you know, that his, uh, you know, we're going to tax people, largest tax increase in in the history of the country, and then we're going to cut taxes. Uh, so I guess that what that means is then from this point forward, instead of calling them the, uh, the Bush tax cuts, maybe we'll call them the McCain tax cuts. Okay, we'll, we'll move now to, uh, to health care reform. Uh, rising health care costs are the greatest inflationary force in the American economy. How do you feel about the presidential candidate's health care reform proposals? What do you support? What do you oppose? And I'll begin with Mark McCracken. Well, what I, what I support doing is we need to look across the board at, uh, you know, what needs to be done with our, with our health care costs. And if, if you look at where, uh, where the majority of, uh, of, you know, of the overhead cost is, it's the 30% profit that, that is being added on by the insurance companies. Um, what I've proposed and what I, what I want to work towards in Washington is the idea of allowing more pooling where uh, it's simply you, you eliminate that overhead um, you know, of the private insurance companies. And this would be a voluntary program that individuals and businesses could get into if they choose. If they want to stay with the private insurance companies and pay more, that's fine. 
But we've done this on a county uh, level basis here in Pennsylvania. We, we formed a, uh, a county uh, purchasing co-op for our insurance. And we've been saving uh, great amounts of money from that, uh, uh, bringing back hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. And what I would like to see on a national basis is uh, allowing polling that uh, individuals and small businesses can go into, a, and it would be a not-for-profit system where they would pay their premiums in and the claims would be paid out with very little overhead costs. As I've said uh, in, in talking about this at, at other events, um, saving that 25 to 30 percent, uh, a small business that's paying a million dollars out now, that would be uh, 250 to 300 thousand dollars a year they could save. Uh, you know, that's that's greater than the tax cut that they would get, and that would be money they could reinvest back in their business and maybe even give their uh, employees better benefits. Jim Fryman, Mark McCracken would like to eliminate the middleman, the insurance companies. It sounds. What would you like to do? I think insurance is the culprit. Uh, big insurance is as bad as big government. Uh, health insurance premiums now cost more than health insurance or uh, than health care used to cost. You, I remember when I was a kid, we didn't have health insurance. That was a long time ago. The doctor came to our house with a black bag. In fact, when I was sick, I remember laying in bed and Dr. Biggins would come in. But uh, my parents didn't have health insurance, and they could afford to pay the doctor. I'm in favor of Bob Barr's uh, policy. He's the libertarian candidate for president. He thinks that uh, we have to limit uh, health insurance providers so they don't pay for uh, the uh, frivolous, not frivolous things, but small things, like going into the doctor for a checkup or for a cold or going uh, to the emergency room for a broken finger. These things would cost, cost much, much less if they weren't covered by insurance. Uh, as a comparison, if your auto, if your health insurance were, or if your auto insurance were like your health insurance, you'd file two or three claims every week to get the gas tank filled up, to get the car washed, to get the oil changed, and of course the uh, garage and the car wash would have to have people to file these claims. It would cost ten times as much to get all these services, and the more people had had that kind of insurance, the higher the prices would go, and the more you'd need it. That's what we have today. The whole idea of employers paying for uh, employees' health insurance is more or less unique to our country. It all started because of a government action during World War II when uh, Roosevelt put wage and price controls on uh, employers, on manufacturers, and they couldn't entice enough employees. Everyone was in the military. They started hiring women for the first time in factories. And uh, to get em uh, more employees, they had to add something in. They couldn't raise the wages, so they added health insurance. And it sounds like Mr. Fryman would like to eliminate health insurance. Well, Mr. Just for, uh, it should just have it for catastrophic needs, things you can't pay for out of pocket. And all those things would go down. The premiums would go down and take some of the burden off American employers. Uh, health care costs would go down. How does... Go ahead, Glenn well, Thompson. Thank you. Well, with uh, let me just address uh, the health insurance companies first. And I mean, that's part of, the, part of the problem. And But one correction, you know, a lot of, a lot of our larger insurance uh, providers are are nonprofit today, um, and uh, I think it's very important that when we look at one of the things we need to do is make sure going forward that we don't create monopolies within our insurance industry. That uh, if insurance companies choose to merge, that any savings that are realized are not passed along to the top executives' big salaries. That those savings are passed along to healthcare consumers by bringing the, by uh, by bringing premiums down and making coverage more affordable. Uh, and you know, and there's been there's been movement in that direction. You know, my my prescription for America's health comes out of 28 years working in healthcare, therapist, healthcare professional, licensed nurse home administrator. You know, I've been to Washington. I've worked on legislation. I've drafted legislation to increase access. And my my plan works at increasing access, affordability, and quality. Part of that is starting with looking at the regulations that are out there. And we have a healthcare system that's just totally burdened with regulations. Now, some regulations are important, there's no doubt about it. But the problem is, over decades, we've layered them on like an onion. And we need to begin to review those and make sure they're still cost effective, they still serve a purpose, they're still doing the job. My experience is there's many out there that are just decreasing access and increasing cost. Those should go away, it'll benefit the consumers. I support tort reform. I work in a nonprofit community hospital for almost three decades. I see how it chases good, good, uh, uh, good physicians away uh, to neighboring states that, that have better situations uh, to practice for malpractice, uh, and frankly, how it adds cost on everybody. 
Uh, there's just many things that we can do. We, I, I support the concept of association health plans. Uh, our unions have been entitled to use that for, for a very long time. Our small businesses should have access to that <coughs> same type of collective uh, organization so that they can negotiate better rates. That needs to be a part of it. We need new models out there, and that's the expertise I'm looking forward to taking to Washington, not just, not just on behalf of the people of the 5th District, but frankly the people of America. We need to look at an outcome-based type payment system for Medicare. You know, uh, medical assistance, we can bring costs down by making sure we have good economic activity and job growth and, uh, and help people find jobs well, and build their resources. The U.S. spends, though, $2 trillion a year. That's 18% of the gross domestic product and twice as much as other uh, developed nations. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, what would a national health insurance uh, purchasing pool help? How do we become more in line with what other nations are doing in terms of the amount of money that's being spent on health care? Well, you know what? The citizens of other countries, when they want really good health care, when they want the highest quality, they want life-saving health care, they come to this country for it. I mean, we have the best care in the world in terms of technology. It's not to say that we don't have opportunity to continue to do better with it. We absolutely do. It's, it's a challenge going forward because of Social Security, I'm sorry, Medicare, and, and uh, the increased utilization of Medicare with the baby boomer generation. We need leadership. We need experienced leadership to, to deal with that. But, you know, I'm, I'm not for universal health care. I've, I've studied that. I've, I've been very hopeful to find uh, where that works because I'm looking for better ways to do things from a health care perspective. It's not universal health care. I always see there is rationing and pri prioritizing, a dumbing down of the medical system, your failure to attract the best and the brightest into uh, a very critical industry that impacts our way of life or our, our quality of life and frankly provides life saving services. If you're just joining us, this is WPSU's live debate among the candidates running for the 5th Congressional District. All three candidates are here this evening Libertarian Jim Fryman, Republican Glenn Thompson, and Democrat Mark McCracken. Uh, our next candidate question will come from uh, Jim Fryman, and then we will go back to, uh, to some health care issues. Go ahead, please, Mr. Fryman. Yes. Uh, where do you stand on the federal government's Real ID Act? And that question goes to Glenn Thompson. Mark McCracken, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I don't support the Real ID Act. That's just another uh, in, infringement on our rights. Uh, you know, we, we've seen so many of, of our rights taken away the, uh, you know, the last 10 years or the last eight years. Um, you know, certainly there needed to be some things put in place, uh, you know, following 9-11 to help identify terrorists that were in our nation. But this idea that, uh, you know, we're going to start, uh, you know, re requiring IDs of our, of our citizens, um, you know, it, it, it's just really step. It. We we stepped over so many lines in in recent years where law-abiding citizens are being uh, are being required, um, you know, to, to to take on other things, and and we need to get back to uh, you know we're the land of the free, and uh, we have rights uh, guaranteed by our constitution. Glenn Thompson. Well, uh, well, I think it's important people understand what it is. It's a national, uh, a national driver's license, basically, as opposed to each state doing a separate uh, driver's license with a separate database to maintain it. It's something that's national. It was proposed by the uh, law enforcement uh, uh, industry uh, to be able to. Uh, well, I'm not sure all the purposes of why they're looking to do it. Track the citizens. I, I, I don't support it. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I appreciate the fact that law enforcement needs new tools today uh, to be able to combat terrorism and to prevent and maintain our security and our safety in this country. Uh, but I, I go along with our state legislature which uh, uh, that rejected this in Pennsylvania. Uh, 21 other states in the nation have rejected the, uh, the Real ID Act. Um, and, uh, and mainly one of the key reasons is you know, today we have all those, uh, all those uh, identification um, uh, that are maintained in all the different states, different databases. You compile that in one database, the security risk there of identity theft is significant. That, that alone should be reasons not to pursue this and do this, let alone all the other reasons why this is just not a good idea at this point in time. The answer to your own question, Mr. Freiman? Well, I agree with both the other candidates. Uh, in addition, I think uh, we should all contact our state representatives. So far, they haven't gone along with this. 
but it's a driver's license is what they're talking about. So when the federal government starts withholding highway funds, a lot of them are going to come around and say, well, it won't hurt you if you're honest and law-abiding. It just reminds me of uh, the old Humphrey Bogart mover, movies, Papers, Please. In uh, the Walkman case in California went to the Supreme Court where the uh, vagrant kept walking through this ritzy neighborhood and the police would throw him in jail when he wouldn't provide identification. And they ruled you don't have to provide identification in this country unless you're accused of being some, doing something wrong by the police. The police can't just walk up to you for no reason and ask you to identify yourself. So you're all in, a, in agreement on that one. We'll move to our next question, which is, what is our next president's most pressing foreign policy challenge? And I'll begin with Jim Fryman. I think the most pressing challenge, even if they don't announce it for uh, domestic consumption, the, the federal government should be keeping a tab on all, our, uh, all the other countries, our friends and enemies. We should have a presence in these com uh, countries, diplomatic presence. We should be talking to them, even if it's on a low-level uh, form of communications. We have to keep our finger on the pulse of these other places to see what they're saying they're doing and what they're saying they think, and then try to read between the lines and uh, see what they're really doing. If possible, we have to have full diplomatic relations with as many of these countries as possible so we can get, as the CIA says, assets on the ground. We need people that look like the people in these countries that are uh, helping us and they can tell us what's going on. Um, first, we have to communicate. I think a lot of not talking to other countries because they're terrorist countries or axis of evil, that's just silly. It's hurting us more than them. Glenn Thompson? Well, in terms of countries, I would, I would put Iran on, on top of that list uh, as uh, the um, potential threat uh, just with, with the discussions, uh, just the way the country, those, that leadership, what they have expressed, what they would like to see happen to the United States, what they would have, like to see happen to our allies like Israel. In terms of uh, uh, foreign uh, um, affairs, in terms of biggest uh, issue that puts us at risk is our dependence on foreign oil. And that feeds right back into that, that issue because, you know, it, right now we're sending annually $700 billion a year to many other countries. And many of those countries would fall within the scope of those who may not be our best allies and may actually use that money to do us harm in, in many different ways, including taking that money, lending it back to us, which we're in a borrowing mode and have been for some time, and then calling our credit. Uh, so the, the, the issue I would put as number one is our dependence on foreign oil today. Mark McCracken? Well, I think a, uh, what something's going to be very important is I think our next president has to repair our foreign policy. Um, you know, we're at the lowest uh, standing that we've been with a lot of our, our allies that, uh, you know, longstanding relationships since World War II. Uh, I mean, we had, we had credibility there that lasted over, you know, over half a century, and you know, we were the, the leader of the free world at that point. Um, you know, over the last eight years, we've lost that, uh, you know, uh, losing some of the allies that, uh, that, that uh, you know, didn't approve of our, uh, our mission in Iraq. So I think the next president is going to have to uh, you know, deal with that, uh, you know, get some of our allies uh, back in line and on board with us. And then secondly, uh, you know, they're going to have to decide uh, what is going to be the, uh, the next move in Iraq and, and where we go from there. Uh, you know, I'm certainly hoping that uh, you know, we're going to see a, uh, the continued movement to bring our troops home and uh, you know, getting, getting out of that military operation. And then uh, you know, concentrating on, on these other threats like Iran and, uh, and North Korea. And, uh, but the best thing we can do is if, if we have a, uh, you know, a good working relationship with our allies, which I think is missing right now. You mentioned Iraq. Uh, that will be the, the topic of our next question. Pennsylvania is, uh, as you all know, the sixth most populous state in the nation. But when it comes to the war in Iraq, we have the third highest casualty rate after California and Texas. So my question is this. Iraq's prime minister says U.S. troops should leave by 2010. Uh, the Bush administration has a draft agreement that U.S. combat troops will be withdrawn from Iraq by 2011. Under what conditions would you support withdrawal of U.S. troops? And we begin with Glenn Thompson. Well, I, I support uh, the strategy that's worked with the deployment of the surge. And that is where, uh, when, we, when we actually took the, uh, the politicians and the bureaucrats out of running that war, and we allowed the professionals, the commanders on the ground, to be able to make the call in terms of troop deployment and tactical decisions. And when that happened, 
the things, um, things began to stabilize there. Uh, my, my son was a part of the 3rd Infantry Division. He was a, on that last uh, unit deployed with the, with the surge, uh, was stationed south of Baghdad, and, and saw that the number of IEDs <coughs> coming in from Iran and other places, and the number of explosions went way down. The people came back out on the streets. The kids were back in school. The, the cottage industries opened back up. And most importantly, the Iraqi uh, Army, the armed forces, uh, the uh, security forces and the neighborhood watch groups, and trust me, it's a little different of a neighborhood watch group than what we have in this country. When they took responsibility, they stepped up and took responsibility for their country. And so I would, I would like to see that our commanders on the ground who are in the best position to provide that type of expertise and direction contribute to that, uh, to that discussion. I don't support published time frames. Um, I think that puts our sons and daughters in harm's way, and I think it puts a stabilizing democracy uh, in a very dangerous part of the world, which is, a, is now an ally of ours, Iraq, <laughs> in, a, in a very precarious situation too when we publish time frames. Milestones that are tied to the Iraqi security forces, armed services, stepping up, we, we bring our sons and daughters home at that point. Do you agree with Mr. Thompson? Well, you know, what I agree with is, you know, I, th I think we're making good progress bringing our troops home, and, uh, you know, this, this is definitely a step in the right direction. You know, as I said earlier, we're spending 10 to $12 billion a month on, uh, you know, on operations there. Um, you know, the American taxpayers have footed that bill long enough, but besides the cost that we've paid, uh, paid in, in money terms, I mean, you mentioned the casualties that we've had, uh, you know, we've had there. So, um, you know, our troops have done their job over there, they won the war, They've secured the country as best as possible. Um, you know, I'm just really concerned that uh, you know, even after we do leave, um, you know, is it going to be a stabilized democracy, or are they going to go back to the uh, the, the unstable uh, ways they've been in the past? So, uh, you know, that, that's such a tricky part of the world over there with the uh, re religious factions and. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important though that we get our troops out of there and uh, you know, we let them survive on their own, however it is. Jim Fryman. I think we have to withdraw our troops as uh, safely and quickly as possible. And some people say, well, will that mean that the people that have died and been wounded there have uh, served in vain? And I don't think so. I mean, our military is good people. It's a voluntary force. I was in the military during Vietnam, and I know this is a different group. They want to do the right thing. Um, I do think that uh, they, they, uh, our enemy there, Al-Qaeda, might just be, uh, have a strategic withdrawal trying to make everyone feel safe there so they can see who's in charge, what's going on. As soon as we withdraw, I think they might come back. But even so, I think we went in there under false pretenses. We had more uh, reason to attack Saudi Arabia than Iraq, and we attacked Iraq. They never attacked us. They, of course, they had weapons of mass destruction. But uh, what country doesn't? We have weapons of mass destruction. It's, uh, I, uh, and, uh, I, I, it's t almost trite, I've said it so often. Someone told me, a retired colonel from the Army, that uh, the war's over, Halliburton won. We'll, we'll move to Iraq on that note, and in fact, or, uh, or Iran, rather. A number of you uh, mentioned Iran as posing a threat. Uh, I'll begin with you, Mark McCracken. Would you support going to war to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon? Well, I, I think what we're going to have to do is, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to engage in diplomacy there. Um, and again, it has to be a, a unified effort, um, you know, with the uh, you know, with our allies and the uh, free nations of the world, um, keeping an eye on them, policing them, uh, you know, you know, setting setting guidelines that they're they're supposed to follow because uh, um, they are a threat. They certainly are a threat to Israel. Um, but, you know, but at this point, I would rather see us engage in diplomacy. Um, I don't know that our military is, is in a position right now to embark on another war. We have to get our military rebuilt, and uh, you know, plus we go back to the fiscal situation. I don't know that we could uh, fiscally uh, uh, you know, afford another military conflict at this point. Jim Fryman? I don't know about a war, but I think if there's uh, some threat from them, with uh, possible missiles that they can put these warheads, if they develop warheads, they can put on missiles or something. We should covertly support Israel if they want to take them out, or we should have strategic strikes to take out uh, any of these facilities without actually putting people on the ground there and having a war. Uh, I don't think we have the ability to fight a war with them. 
Iraq fought a war with them, and uh, they, Iran lost over a million people, and they showed no signs of slowing down. Of course, a lot of those weren't even, they were civilians, they weren't even military, but uh, I don't think we should be going to war with Iran. Glenn Thompson. Well, I mean, this is, uh, this is a real scary situation. I, I mean, I think that the, the, the leaders in the country of Iran have already made it very clear what they would like to do, not just to Israel, but to the United States. And, and for them to, uh, have, uh, to have nuclear capabilities uh, in terms of their weapons, I, I think that's a very dangerous situation. And I think we would need to stand with our ally, I Israel, um, and, um, and support them in, you know, if they, uh, you know, if they would choose to take action uh, against Iran. I, I think we certainly continue the route of diplomacy, and we work hard to make that work. Uh, we do that with multiple nations, multiple partners, and trying to, to see if we can uh, uh, have them reach some, some level of, of reasoning. But, uh, you know, I think we, in the end, we, we certainly need to stand by our, our, our ally if, uh, if it looks like there's an imminent use, an imminent threat of of uh, nuclear weapons. Our next question comes from our live chat and, and moves us in an entirely different direction. This is from Jess from State College who asks, what sort of alternative energy sources do you support researching? And I believe I begin with Glenn Thompson. Oh, I support researching them all. Uh, I, I think we need to do that. Uh, the researchers I've talked with at Penn State, we are we are uh, probably generations away from getting anything developed to the point where it's productive enough to replace what we need for what we utilize fossil fuels with right now. Uh, uh, wind, solar, and hydro right now make up less than 1% of our energy needs in this country. So if we work real hard and double it, that's 2%. And so we need to continue to support research. Uh, uh, let me, uh, talking with the researchers, uh, specifically here at Penn State and other places within the district, I would say that uh, the things that here that, that have the most promise for us, I, I would say that that includes uh, uh, solar and cellulosic ethanol. And the science on neither is to the point where it's productive. Cellulosic ethanol, actually, the science isn't perfected yet to be productive. but. It should be within reach, and, and, and that probably is promising within the near future. Uh, that's a great fit for the 5th Congressional District because you can utilize wood waste products, and, and we have great timber industry in the 5th District. Uh, solar, uh, from the, the individuals I talk with, hold the, has the greatest potential going forward, but that's a long ways off from being productive enough to, to be able to meet uh, the majority of our of our energy needs. Certainly we have a clean technology with this energy boom with the Marcellus Shale, the natural gas. That's a very exciting economic opportunity, an opportunity for us to, to bring cost of uh, energy down, uh, to benefit from them economically, and, and, uh, and it's very clean. Uh, we, we know from the 52 buses that run with CATA here in, in Center County that it's, a, it's just a, a great fuel to be able to use. The fuel is clean, but, but there are questions about uh, extracting the fuel. <laughs> From the Marcellus Shale, uh, in terms of the natural gas is a clean fuel, but but there are concerns about uh, environmental concerns with well, extracting Marcellus Shale. Although you know what, most of the people I've talked with, the, the people in that industry, and the people that are talking with uh, even the uh, Chesapeake Bay uh, initiative folks, finding that that there there's not as much uh, when you really look at the facts there, it, it's there isn't a lot of concerns in terms of ex extracting that. Uh, even when it comes to utilization, the volume of waters that are being used, uh, uh, the state has come on the, on the record and said that it, it, compared to other uses of water, it's not significant. And, um, and frankly, the economic benefits and the energy benefits that are out there are really, really good for, and, and the great part about it is the Marcella Shells in 15 of the 17 counties in the 5th Congressional District. Mark McCracken. Well, you know, I, I certainly support the, uh, the ethanol projects that we have going on in Clearfield County right now. Um, it is corn-based ethanol to start out with, um, 108 million gallons a year. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're making great progress over there. Just in the last uh, three weeks, uh, people were just amazed at how quickly the plant's going up. It's, it's due to go online in 2010. But, but the thing is, Bioenergy, the company that uh, is, is putting that plant up, 
Uh, you know, their plan is after five years they want to go to cellulosic ethanol. Uh, the technology isn't there right now, but the great thing that's happening is they're already partnering with Penn State University and they're going to be partnering with Clarion also, uh, you know, to be doing research on, on the cellulosic end of it. Uh, and that's going to be really, really a key thing and it's, it's going to be a big boon to the, uh, uh, the economy in the area. And uh, you know, secondly, uh, as far as the Marcellus Shale goes, that has a huge potential here also, but we do have to be very careful of the environmental impacts that it could have. In, in Clearfield County and a lot of the counties around, we had certainly had the coal boom back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, but it had its environmental dangers with it also. So we need to be very careful um, you know, how, we, how we utilize this resource, but it can be a very good thing, but we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past with the environment. Jim Fryman. I think we have to, for electricity, we have to concentrate more on uh, on-site generation. Most uh, of electricity that we use in this country is used up traveling through the wires. Over half the electric is used up in transmission. If we generated electric for home use, for business use, at on-site with solar panels, windmills, whatever, biogas, whatever people can come up with, it would save that loss. It's a more efficient use of it, even transporting the fuel if you have to transport biomass fuel to the local site. And also, uh, whoever does this locally should be allowed to, when they're, they're uh, generating more electric than they're using, sell it to the electric company and be connected to the grid so they can use it. I also think we should give an individual income tax credit dollar per dollar. If someone spends $8,000 to put solar panels on their house, even if it only generates $1,000 worth of electric a year, they should get $8,000 credit on their income tax in the year they take it. Sounds and, like a good deal. And uh, we need on-site generation. We should continue research and development. And some studies have said that uh, ethanol from corn actually uses more energy than it uh, creates when you make it. So we have to keep working on this. And I think President Bush's idea of uh, generating or uh, creating a certain amount of uh, ethanol from corn by whatever year isn't realistic. I was reading an article that said in uh, Atlantic magazine that uh, it would take every acre of arable farmland in the United States to grow enough corn. We still couldn't generate and enough. And I think everyone here agreed that cellulosic would be the, the, the place to move. I'm going to move to uh, <laughs> uh, back, if we could, to health care. And uh, this question is about Medicare. According to the Medicare trustees, Medicare is in worse shape than the Social Security Fund and will go bankrupt in 2019. That's 20 years before Social Security's insolvency. The number of retired baby boomers is increasing. The number of workers paying into Medicare is decreasing. What would you propose to keep this program afloat? Glenn Thompson. Well, I, I go back to looking at uh, uh, making sure that we have outcome-based medicine, uh, at looking at uh, revising our Medicare payment system, um, so that we're paying based on the outcomes and, and something that, uh, brings the, that helps to bring costs down, that uh, an outcome-based payment system, as I would envision it, would be, you know, based on the, uh, uh, right now we pay on treatment procedures and there's coding with that. It's a very complex system and it gets very expensive. It puts a lot of overhead into our healthcare system of, of that has nothing to do with delivering costs. And so... Delivering care. Delivering care, uh, yeah. And so we need to shift to be able to focus on delivering care. and emphasize and looking at outcomes and be able to and with the part of that you reduce costs by with that kind of a system you could encourage uh, further reduction of hospital acquired infections and secondary complications and 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 again I go back to uh, the cost of providing care is driven up by by regulations, the uh, HIPAA is a is a great example of that instituted under under President Clinton, and you know the Health Insurance Privacy and Portability Act sounds good on the surface. You know everybody wants their with their uh, uh, they want their uh, their confidentiality maintained, but you it's incredible how many layers of bureaucracy and the cost of that has impacted every aspect and arena of our healthcare system. And so I'm looking forward to being a part of that debate of, of taking almost 30, uh, 30 years of expertise because we need to make some real change in terms of health care to make sure that it's affordable and accessible and that we're maintaining the quality and standard of care that we as Americans have come to enjoy. Mark McCracken, what would you propose to keep this program afloat? 
Well, you know, I think the first thing we have to look at, you know, where our priorities are at. And we need to get uh, not only with Medicare but overall health care to realize that the priority has to be with the people that need, uh, you know, need to care and coverage. Uh, and we didn't even get the chance uh, on the earlier question to, to, to mention. I mean, we've got 37 million people in this, uh, uh, this country that are uninsured and many more that are underinsured. And... Uh, to me, this all comes back around to where we're at with our fiscal policies. If we would have good fiscal policies in this country, and if we would have continued what had started in the 90s, um, uh, you know, where, we had a, where we had a surplus that was, I believe, $250 billion, the debt was coming down, when we would hit these kind of crises as we are in, in 2019 with the uh, Medicare, uh, you know, if we would have a healthy surplus, we could absorb those costs and take care of it. Um, but it really is going to come down across the board. We've got to figure out what our priorities are. And like I said, when you're talking about people that need health care coverage and medical coverage, that should be our priority and, and, and what we should be looking at. Um, but, but like I said, the government right now is hamstrung. Uh, they, they don't have the funds to, to fix this. So they're going to have to raise more funds. How do you raise more funds? You're going to have to raise taxes uh, or fees. Jim Fryman. I've attended uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield healthcare seminars, so-called seminars. They were just two days of shrimp and champagne, and they passed out a couple mimeographed high, uh, handouts. I think there's a lot of waste in insurance. Insurance is the problem in affordability of health care. I think the 37 million people that are uninsured that uh, Mr. McCracken talks about could probably afford health care if there were more people that uh, just had basic health care, not health maintenance. There again, it's like having uh, insurance coverage to get gas in your car and to get it washed and get the oil changed. You couldn't afford it without it if everyone had it. We need to uh, get a lot more just <coughs> catastrophic coverage health insurance and maybe even prohibit uh, anything else. So you can afford to go to the doctor, you can afford to go get a shot, you can afford to uh, have uh, skin cancer removed, whatever. Just, we just need coverage for catastrophic illness. Once we do that, health care will be affordable again. Our final question is a question that comes to us tonight from the Punxsutawney spirit. I'll begin with Jim Fryman, and that question is, how will you plot your own course in the 5th District on the heels of Congressman John Peterson, who has served for so many years, and we have limited time? Well, I'm in a unique situation. If I'm elected, I won't take a bipartisan approach. You'd have to call it tripartisan, I guess, or maybe nonpartisan. Um, there are no libertarians in Congress right now. I think uh, my forte is talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. I'd have to talk to these people and try to convince them what I think is right. I have a lot of mainly symbolic things I'd like to change in Congress. First of all, I think to eliminate bipartisanship, they shouldn't be seated with the Democrats on one side, the Republicans on the other. They should alternate them a little. So when they look over to see how their neighbor's voting, it's not someone of the same party. Or when they talk to them about why they're voting that way, they maybe get a different outlook. The parties control the legislators too much. We have to free up the individual legislators because I think every one of them goes in there with good intentions. It's just the party corrupts them. Glenn Thompson? Well, uh, my plan is uh, within the first six weeks that, uh, after I go to Congress on behalf of all the citizens, all 17 counties in this district, is to make, get an appointment with, with every ranking member and every chair of every committee in the House. Uh, that would be Republicans and Democrats. And I know when, uh, when, I, when they look in their calendar and they see this freshman from rural Pennsylvania, they're going to wonder, well, what does he want? Well, here's what I want. I want to let them know I'm in town. I want to know that I'm here to represent the people of the 5th District. And uh, now the next time I come to see him, it might be with a very specific need, representing the, the rural needs of this, of this great district. I also want to use my background as a healthcare professional. I've learned that you do an assessment. So that first, that means I'm going to maintain a, a long relationship and good communications with all 17 and counties. Let's give Mr. McCracken a chance to respond. Uh, yeah, and, and my thing is I'm going to be a hands-on legislator, um, you know, working for the people of the 5th District, because I think that's very important that you, you, know, you understand the people are sending you to Washington. And I want to go down there and I want to make the tough decisions that are going to be necessary to put this uh, country back in the right direction. And they're not going to be easy decisions. They're going to be tough decisions, and they need to be made. And that concludes tonight's debate. The candidates for the 5th Congressional District will discuss other pressing issues in our final Voto 8 debate on Thursday, October 30th at 7 p.m. on WPSU-FM. We hope you'll join us. Thank you to the candidates and to the local newspapers for submitting questions for tonight's debate. 
and thank you for joining us. Visit our website, wpsu.org slash vote08, where you can see our print partners and check out Candidate Central, an interactive feature designed to help you learn more about the candidates on your ballot. Election Day is November 4th. Don't forget to vote. This has been a presentation of Penn State Public Broadcasting. I'm Patty Satalia. Good night. Stay tuned to WPSU for Issues PA and an examination of the new economy and Pennsylvania's workforce. Next. Presentation of Vote 08 on WPSU is made possible in part by a grant from Caparilla Furniture, serving central Pennsylvania for over 50 years with showrooms in Belfont, Altoona, and Lewistown. Featuring Thomasville Furniture. Information at caparillafurniture.com. Additional support comes from the members of WPSU.